qualify for the 92nd running of the Indianapolis 500. We started last week putting the first 11 in. Yesterday we filled the field. Today it's bump day. Dominguez with three minutes and 45 seconds and counting hitting the tech line. This will be the final qualifying attempt. Does Mario Dominguez make it in? Into the green, down the back straightaway. Just looks strong. And now for Dinner with Racers with your hosts, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman. Blade Holder Radio Sound. I'm a driver, I'm very angry. The sound of a driver on the radio during a race. When uh, the latest issue of Racer Magazine came out, there was a quarter page ad in it put up there by Pacific Coast Motorsports. They were out of business. They were offering to go do service for anybody, road racing, etc. Then this deal came together. This deal was so late, and they did it on such a shoestring that members of PCM Motorsports actually had to max out their credit cards to get here. So tell me about the first time driving through that tunnel, knowing you're going to practice today. It, it's hard to describe the feelings with words, but you kind of feel like a superhero. You sort of get the sense that there's a lot of people that came before me to make it the way it is, and the fact that I'm a part of it is something very special. We know we have the team, we know we have the people that are capable. We know in Mario, he's a great driver. I can't believe I'm going to drive here. Yeah. So you're heading into the Indianapolis 500, having turned how many laps in this car? None. Is that common? Yeah, that would be very uncommon. In fact, right. it probably shouldn't happen. But you probably had the same amount of crew members as every other team that was there, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, about half. <laughs> How many of your guys had run the Indy 500 before? None. The hardest race on the schedule. And he is out, so he will get one more shot to put it into the field and could potentially be our last qualifier because we're coming up on two minutes. So you got some photos for us. Yeah. All right, so this looks like uh, Ryan DL, Alex Figgy, and then who's this good looking guy next to him? That's the main man, that's Tom Figgy. So that's Alex's dad, and that's the guy who sort of, you know, pushed this whole thing. In fact, I gotta be honest, without those two guys right there, Alex and Tom, I don't have a motorsports career, right? They took me as a manager to a team that they were working at and said, hey, let's do Pacific Coast together, and we had the best eight year run anybody could ever have. It was amazing. I met him for the first time when we were competing against each other in Atlantic, and um, he was um, a trippy guy, you know, <laughs> trippy, tri <laughs> trippy team. That's one yeah. way of putting it. How so? You know, didn't conform to the to the norms. Right. But I think that you know, that's what makes Tyler perfect. At the time, I had the most mileage with Tyler. I'm pretty sure. For sure. I think '99 or 2000 is when we first met. And we broke up right away. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right away. Yeah. Basically, our careers kind of kept intertwining. I would say a portion of why I'm here in California is due to Tyler. So where'd you grow up? Bend, Oregon. Nice. We've been there. Yeah, it's a good spot, man. Yeah. At the time, it was a town of 15, 18,000 people. Yeah, and yeah. so you, you went out in the woods and you drank beer. <laughs> so easy to get in trouble. For sure. <laughs> easy to get in trouble, and especially if you got a nose for it. 
No high school diploma, yep. rehab at 17. Did you really? Absolutely. Wow. My folks divorced when I was about 10, got up Christmas morning, and mom had found out that dad was getting her a Mercedes for Christmas. So she literally took delivery of the Mercedes, grabbed the bag, put it in the car, and said adios. Oh, wow. Whoa. Yeah, so I don't like Christmas, by the way. And then when they separated, I kind of went off the deep end and I was looking, I was, I had a good nose for trouble as a young kid. And I learned a long time ago that you get a lot more things with sugar mm -hmm. than salt. Mm -hmm. And so I could sweet talk my mom and I kind of owned her. So even when I would get in trouble, it wouldn't really be that much trouble and she'd understand. And so both my brother and myself took full advantage of that. So I did a stint. I sold some timeshare for a while. I did really good there. Actually sold And this a bunch is where you sort of start channeling your dad's yeah. ability. Yeah, to sell. yeah exactly. Yeah. And Plus then, this is timeshare, so partying. I'm partying yeah. at yeah. one, yeah. that's yeah. exactly it. But those skills, I'll tell you what, it is super helpful uh, for sure to bullshit. <laughs> to be people, a douchebag salesman. To, to be a douchebag sales guy. And it was it was easy. About the time I actually started to get a conscience and realize, man, maybe I'm not doing this as you know, just because I'm making money doing this doesn't mean it's okay. The company that I was working for in Seattle was uh, sued by the Attorney General for unscrupulous business practices and some things of these nature. And I didn't like that, man. I was like, all of a sudden, I'm like, You're like, you might go to jail? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. yeah this is bad. Crazy, I've always wanted to race cars, and I'm going to be too old to do this if I don't do this right now, yeah. and I got no reason to not do it. Yeah. I got rid of my house and put my stuff in storage and moved to Aptos, started dropping resumes at, Skip Barber was at Laguna at the time. Jim Russell was up at Sonoma. Finally, World Speed, yeah. Chuck West mm -hmm. and Tilo Stewart hired me in Sonoma yeah. as the new team grunt. My first job was scraping stickers off a trailer in the rain. Yeah. And I was ecstatic. And all the other mechanics were standing at the doorway. Just watching this idiot. Yeah, from the <laughs> inside. And they're like, check this idiot out. Who's this Gomer? Three years there. Just as a grunt. Yeah, as a grunt. Yeah. And ended up getting uh, becoming the truck driver. I was the truck driver Whoa. for the Atlantic team. But the team was tough. And so at mid-Ohio, uh, the whole crew quit. Everybody. It was the full mutiny. You know, we were under budget to uh, begin with, and yeah. then, you know, owner would fly in and fly out, and we'd be left in the van with yeah. you know, bad places to stay and not enough food. It was just, it was just a really rough set of circumstances, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only people who were made to suffer were the team members and not the owner, yeah. right? So that was one of the things that I took when I came to ownership was, man, you know, we all we all live and die together, right? Mm -hmm. You were doing this together, right? If, if, if I'm gonna ask you to eat a shit sandwich, I'm gonna eat it with you. Well, I came back, they hired me as a team manager. Mm -hmm. So grunt to truck driver to now team manager, team manager in Atlantics. Alex Figgy had been a customer of World Speeds about three years previous. Fast forward to the end of 2001, World Speed doesn't have a program. I'm the manager of the program. I run into Alex and Tom at Laguna Seca the last race of the year, and I tackle them basically, and mm -hmm. I'm like, guys, you gotta come back, Alex. Let's go race in Atlantic cars. We got a great program here. It'll be da 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 da. And I coerce them into coming to World Speed and basically put that car on the track for the program, right? Yeah. So it keeps my job, keeps the program going. And we do 2002 together at World mm -hmm. Speed. So they come to World Speed. We do the year at World Speed. Mm -hmm. At the end of the year, the issues that they had with the owner were the same issues they had at the end of the year. And so they come to me and they say, dude, we're gonna do our own thing and we want you to run the show for us. Do you wanna do this? And I'm like, of course, let's yeah. go do this. Yeah. It's AAA ball, right? And it is one step below the big majors. And, and at that time, it was no holds barred. Lots of open areas for competition, you know. It was, it was some big time stuff, you know. So to do well there was doing well, for sure. The one thing I remember specifically was like, those guys are having a lot of fun. Man. Like all the crew guys seem to be really getting along. I mean, it looked like guys that wanted to hang out and oh, there's a race car that we got to work on too. You know, I talk about the things that I learned at World Speed that man, I would look around the paddock being at the worst yeah. program that I'd ever been yeah. at going, man. So when I got the opportunity to do that, man, it was full bore. Yeah. And we did, we had yeah. a blast. It was the most fun. And you can go back and talk to almost any one of the guys who worked with us over that window of time. And they'll tell you, dude, one of the best, if not the best time I ever had, just because it was purely about 
fun and racing. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. You know, and, and it was the the golden goose. And I've got a kid here who's got ability. I've got a dad who basically trusts me blindly, right? Like here's the open checkbook. All we want to do is win. You're in charge of making that happen. Just go do it. Everybody should get to go racing like that. It was fing awesome. Yeah. So we went in our first year as a single car team. Did all right, you know, had a podium finish. It wasn't really where we wanted to be. Blossomed in 2004, then to a two car team. Brought on a guy like John Fogarty, which was, that was sort of the juggernaut. But you know, the interesting thing was, Alex ended up winning our first race for us in Monterey, which was Bedlam then afterward. That was a pretty reasonable night of celebration there afterward. <laughs> yeah. My wife and I were in New Orleans. We were having a vacation and just, I mean, kind of at random, I got a call from Tyler. And uh, I was super stoked because it was like, all right, I got a guy, obviously he can run it. Right. right? He can win. So he if he's win. not winning. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that was never not the case. So right. Right. Fair, fair. A beautiful crystal trophy that goes to John Fogarty. Wow. No, I don't think this year was so much about me, but maybe between more about the battle between Ryan, myself, Sierra Sierra, and Pacific Coast. You know, it was a hard-fought battle all year long. You know, we were fortunate to uh, have things go our way more often than not, and uh, and be there with the performance as well. So it's an awesome job for my guys. Heart-pounding experience of seeing a 750 horsepower machine thundering by at speeds approaching 200 miles per hour. Champ Car is formidable and unique as a premier sporting property, allowing unprecedented corporate and spectator access to your brand. Southern California-based Pacific Coast Motorsports is a professional racing organization with all the resources necessary to succeed at the highest levels of auto racing in the world. Any questions, ask. All right. Thanks, guys. Let's go to work. Uh, Tom and Jennifer, his wife, Tom Figgy now, and Jennifer Figgy are in Aspen, one, one, one of their homes, and they're out to dinner one night. And Kevin Kalkoven happens upon them. and Who's the Champ Car boss. At that time, he yeah. owns Champ Car, and he's a big player in, in motorsport, was for about a five-year window of time. He ran into them at dinner one night. And, and, and in really, Aspen. In Aspen. Purely coincidence. Purely coincidental. And he sells Jennifer on Champ Car. So Kevin Kalkoven understood that if the wife is interested in the guy's hobby, then it's a done deal. Respect, comradeship. So I didn't actually join Tyler until 2007. I figured he wanted to do um, Champ Car, and so Tyler rang me up. Sounds like an interesting project and I met with Tyler and and Tom and we talked about it and you know it may have seemed like a little obscure at the time but I felt that it would be a step up in my career. It's sort of the beginning of a new era for Pacific Coast Motorsports you know I mean we've never done this before. I think I started in December. But you'd had champ car experience prior to this. Correct yeah. You knew that it wasn't the size of the operation you would need in a champ car team. No and I, I had already experienced what it takes to run one of these cars. I realized pretty early on that that it was a, a big endeavor we're about to embark on. Tim, obviously on the engineering side, when you hear of the idea of going to Champ Car, which is a few steps above where you're at on oh, the right yeah. level, how ready do you guys think you are? Oh, not at all. Not at all. We have two rookie drivers and two rookie engineers. How we just presented it from the get-go is like, this is bare minimum a th three-year project, right? Don't expect anything from 2007. Oh, we got some experience already back sure there with the back of the field. Figgy, possibly? Yes, indeed. Car. Alex Figgy. How would you summarize that 2007 initial champ car season? A learning experience, a whole lot of items that we didn't even know we needed to know about that we learned that we were going to have to be on top of. What you'll need to do is when you lay the gun down, you're not, like right? you got it like that. 
And when you come back up, you don't want to have to go like this. Mostly a learning experience. Like we just didn't know what we didn't know. You really can't appreciate how many people it takes. And when you see a, a car that's running well and a, an effort that is successful and is winning races, man, that's a lot of people working hand in hand together. That's a hard thing to do. Is this, so this is just Sunday, 9.30 Mexico City traffic? Yes. Why are there no lanes? Oh, uh, it's Mexico. <laughs> I did only like three races, I think, in 2007. Mm -hmm. But you know, we were we were improving a, a lot on the the team and everything. So we bring in Mario Dominguez, who spent some time with Forsyth. He's driven for a bunch of other Champ Car teams. He's done done well. Tom, at this point, is getting to the where he wants to to see some results, you know, and we're used to seeing results by the end of the year. We've been able to produce results everywhere else we were reasonably well in that window of time. Last race of that Champ Cars did and we finished on the podium. Right. And I gave the PCM team and the Figgy family their first podium, so I was very proud of that. Mario then sort of let us know that we were pretty far off on the car mm -hmm. and we needed some to do some work on the car. So that's when we started looking at bringing in some additional engineering help or maybe even making an engineering change. We just talked about what do you want, what do you need, you know, he's asking me what I want and I'm asking him what he needs, you know, it's like he didn't really want me on the champ car next year and I didn't really want to be there. So the season starts to wrap up, you guys have some success? A little bit, we were getting better, we were getting better. So 2008, it's going to be Alex Figgy, Mario Dominguez and the roster of the team mm -hmm. and you are set for 2008. Yep. It's funded, it's ready to go. Yep. Yep. All focused on 2008, ready to go. We'll begin with Tony George with some opening comments. Tony? <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. This is a very exciting day um, to be here with Kevin, uh, representing his partners in Champ Car, uh, to publicly uh, address all of you. Um, and confirm that, in fact, we are going to uh, unify the sport of open-wheel racing in North America. How long did it take from Champ Car saying they were folding to Tom telling you he didn't want to be in the sport anymore? 24 hours. Four wow. days, like, he was done. It really yeah. pissed him off. He's like, are you <laughs> kidding me? I think anybody watching something like this probably knows about the Indy Racing League Champ Car split but effectively there were two different indycar series happening at the time so champ car which is what you've been discussing but there was this rival nearly all oval based indy racing league which had the indy 500 which was the series that had the indycar naming rights so the expectation is that all of these teams are going to merge into what was effectively the IRL. correct it's yeah. going to become indycar so tom figgy based on cal coven's word at a club in aspen put millions of dollars into this series. About 11, I figure. Yeah. And Tom didn't want to take Alex oval racing. Alex didn't want to go oval racing. That's yeah. part of the reason we didn't look at doing that. You know, that's recklessly dangerous. And we didn't, we didn't want to do that. That's yeah. not what they wanted to do. How do the figgies tell you that they're not coming back? Uh, a phone call that then led to a meeting that we had. And basically it was, Tyler, we're done. This is done. We're done. I'm done doing this. I've been bamboozled. I spent $11 million last year. Now I have paperweights for cars. I'm pissed and we're done. I'm done. It's not just about the safety. It's also he is pissed at He's pissed, Carter. man. He's been totally taken advantage of. You know, I mean, that's a lot of racing, $11 million, you know, and, and, and it was supposed to be under a bunch of false pretenses. So, Tyler, what are you going to do? Beat the clock. America's favorite fun show with stunts, prizes, and the big cash bonus. So, Tyler, what are you going to do? So I take a look at the books, and we've got about $800,000 in revolving debt at that time. And we hadn't been paying anything for a month or so because we were figuring out what we are doing. And I got three hundred grand in equity in my home. 800 plus 300 is 1.1. Tom, I can buy this. I'm going to buy this thing. I'm buying it. I'm going to buy it. So I go to Tom, and it's, I don't bother talking to my attorney or anything. I don't, I'm not going to ask anybody about this because, sure, I'm going to get talked out of it. And I don't want to get talked out of it. This is a great idea. I'm not going to buy this thing. And so, so I did. So I go to Tom and his attorney, and I say, guys, 
how about we do this instead of deep six in this thing i want all the equipment i want the trucks i want the trailers i want the shop and i'll inherit all the debt and i'll give you 300 grand cash so that's 1.1 million dollars for all the stuff what do you want to do and tom looks at his attorney his attorney goes tom you got to take this deal mm -hmm. so you literally wake up one morning with a job beautiful 2008 ahead you get to the shop and the series you're in is gone as is the team it was one of those moments where there was no like salesmanship or any right. of this stuff it was like okay well this is done our investor is out i'm gonna try to make it work i remember the the part of the speech about if you can't risk it if you need steady income then now is your time to go you get your warning because after the next paycheck then That's there's nothing else. else yeah I remember the conversation and it was very brief. I think it was like 10 seconds and I was like, all right, go, let's do it. Had you indicated anything to her prior that you were even thinking this? No, I hadn't indicated to her what level of, like we were really going all in, gonna lose the house, gonna lose the business, gonna lose everything if it doesn't work out. I don't know that she 100% knew that. She just said, let's go. We've known each other for a while now. You seem very sensible to me. <laughs> uh, what is your opinion when you start hearing this? I mean, it's scary. Pacific Coast was, in a lifetime, there are a few places that it feels like family, it feels like more than a team, it feels like more than work. Tyler, Tyler brought that to this team. It was a family, and I think we all believed that we can make this work, and we're in it for the long haul, we're committed, and... <laughs> God really? damn you, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, oh I forget that. Penske was on the right and Ganassi was on the left. <laughs> just so just so we're clear. How quickly does it come to light that this is not gonna be easy? The first lap. <laughs> bad. <laughs> bad. Very bad. We did our rookie orientation and the shakedown of the car at the same time. <laughs> so like literally the first four laps that car turned were in rookie orientation. If he didn't pass the rookie orientation, we weren't gonna get to race. So that was literally, that was our first hurdle. That was the, and we have to make this car runnable in time for Mario to be able to do his rookie orientation. You have a rookie orientation program which consists of all the rookies have never raced in the 500. They have to go through a day of orientation. So we go out for the first time to, to do some laps and, you know, at a slow speed. I was killing myself at 200 miles an hour. I thought, oh my, I mean, I'm, this, I'm gonna crash. Yeah. This is not a rumor, but it was very slow and I couldn't do it. So I went into the pits and, White and like, shit. you know this. This you know the problems have started. And right. So they discovered they had left the the rear wing the opposite. <laughs> so as practice goes on, you Tyler are confident of making the race, but it seems like the team has really had their eye on qualify more than anything else. So all of your attention isn't about race pace. It isn't about full fuel runs. It is let's see if we can string four laps together. One hundred percent. Can only afford so many sets of tires, mm -hmm. and those tires are only going to give the first four laps one time. So mm -hmm. it's not like I've got 20 sets of tires to go do four qualifying simulations to get it just right. Whenever you run a qualifying sim, yeah. Whenever a guy runs stickers, stickers being new tires. Every time you put stickers on them, their confidence level jumps. Right. If you could just throw stickers at a left, right, and center, that's what you would do. More importantly, if you are, let's say, a budget limited team. Then you um, can't do that. <laughs> so then I make a mistake. I'm coming out of the pits and the driver coach is like, okay, push hard, push hard so you can practice for the race, you know. I was stupid enough. I didn't have to push hard out of the pits. I was already killing myself. Yeah, of yeah. course, I lost it and psh, crashed. Yeah. And how many days have you been in? Uh, maybe it was the second day. <laughs> On a team with no money. And this is going to take some repairs. Yes, it's gonna take so repairs. It was not hard, it was just like one corner. One corner is still a big invoice. Yeah. It's a big invoice and when you have no money, it's a bigger. Right. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is that I'm thinking to myself, I don't really care what we have to spend to get in the race today because if we don't get in the race, it doesn't matter in any case, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much deaf <laughs> Regardless, I'm yeah. not there was between Man, three yeah. grand over and 10 grand over. 100%. Yeah. Indianapolis off into the distance. We're at the motor racing capital of the world, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and it's day three of qualifying for the 92nd running of the Indianapolis 500. You guys are putting stickers on when you can as you're doing these practice runs. Are you just adding to a debt every time these new tires go 1 on? One million percent. Are you thinking about this every time it happens? For sure. Yeah. Do you have any idea that this is happening? I would say not, not as it's happening. Did you restrict tires? No. The only reason I didn't restrict tires is because they didn't make me. They just let me charge whatever I needed to. You're going to lose it all if you don't do this. So what's one more I'm set all of tires? Yeah, it doesn't yeah, make yeah, any yeah, difference. Right. Absolutely right. Like if you're dumb enough to give me credit, I'm going to buy the right. tires. Yeah. When we started the day, we had a total of 22 cars to fill the field. It has been a very active afternoon. One spot remains. You need any comments? So Saturday morning. You've done practice now for several days. You're working on qualifying sims. And in 2008, the way qualifying worked was of 33 spots, 32 are going to be locked in on that Saturday. So you just need to be in the top 32. It doesn't matter what happens the next day where five other cars are going to compete for one spot. You just need to be somewhere in that top 32 and you're set. And, and, and we are comfortably within that top 32. And this earlier today, Mario Dominguez in the 96, he gets into the wall for the second time here in the month of May. They are working feverishly to try and get that car repaired because as we show you the cars that have no backup, the drivers have one car, there is Mario Dominguez. They are feverishly trying to get that car repaired. 
after you stuff a indie car in the wall you buy a lot of parts mm-hmm. is there any hint that the financial hit from that crash is going to be a big problem down yeah, the road absolutely but i mean you know at that point in time we're in yeah you know committed chips are in we've got to go somebody damages the car you can replace that section bolt on the new piece and it may take x amount of time but generally it's a pretty simple process but this is indie it's not that easy correct the differences at Indy, because everything is that little bullseye, after you've bolted it on, you need to absolutely make sure that all the settings are exactly back the way they were. So the time is not just repairing or replacing the parts, it's also recalibrating everything. We're, we're measuring to the thousandth of an inch. So to get it back to a window where, you know, at 222 we don't make the race, but at 224 we do. Well, two miles an hour difference at that level, the minute changes that are necessary to make that happen, you know, it's, it's a big deal. the final day to qualify for the 92nd running of the Indianapolis 500. We started last week putting the first 11 in. Yesterday, we filled the field. Today, it's bump day. Let the bumping begin. So we woke up that morning going to bump day, and it's like, I'm, I'm going to need to focus every ounce of experience, everything I've ever done in my whole life to try to set up this car and make it drivable. We still had belief in ourselves. We're just gonna go through this and come out on top because that's who we are, that's we're here and we have the speed. And I don't think there was any extra trepidation or any of this stuff. It was just, let's go do the job. Like we're here to do a job, let's go do it. How clear is it that this day is going to have a massive effect on your program? We all knew this was serious. Okay. Like, so that part of it, I thought, Man, I'm over here doing the Atlantic stuff. I, sh- I should be getting a paycheck. <laughs> but <laughs> this is all going to work out. And they just got to put this thing in the field. I recall the crew just being very buttoned down on what they were doing. You know, just understanding what the goal was. I'm sick to my stomach about the whole thing, right? I've got it mechanically back together like it runs now, but the right window or the right mirrors and the right front wing gurney and the right end fence, like, oh, you have to have all these little pieces that equal quarter miles of an hour here and there, but they're the difference between the making it and not making it, right? So gathering up all these other pieces and all, uh, when we finally got to Sunday, uh, I was hopeful. Who are the guys you're up against to get in the field? Roger Yasukawa, Buddy Lazier, Marty Roth, Max Pappas. At Indy, all of them have a reasonable amount of pace. For sure. Yeah. And they're all successful, accomplished, good race car drivers. I mean, And Marty Roth. And Marty Roth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got, we got the speed. We need more front wing. I would say half and half. And we're ready to go. That's a lot, you sure? We have a lot of honesty, right? I don't think I've ever been more focused in my life trying to set up the car. You know how it is, you start, you know, going through data and yeah. do some laps and I don't like this and I'm like, okay, this worked, this didn't, this. And we started improving the speed. What time did I do in that lap? 2.18.8, so you were ahead the speed, no worries. So we got it. So we said, okay, let's let's try, let's do this. We, we did some practice runs and yeah. the car felt good. Okay, let's, let's go out to the qualifying. Well, you heard the engine start for Mario Dominguez. Remember, the number has to be better than 218.010. So I go out and we finally have the car where I wanted it to, the limit where the car could be drivable. Boy, I'll tell you what, he went into the red coming between turn three and through turn four. Here he comes back to the start finish line over the yard of bricks. 217.829. That will not get it done. So, fully focused, I went out to do the run, and I totally felt the wind picked up big time in the back straight. Crosses the yard of bricks. Lap number two, 217.7. 
We were well in the field the day previous before he had crashed the car. So we were five miles an hour off of where we were the day before. So they probably made a decision to put a lot of downforce in the car to make sure it would be stable and maybe they've overcorrected. In which they can do that because they have three tries here today. If this doesn't yes. work, Absolutely. they take the next step and try it again. We were starting back from square zero, basically, and so all those little adjustments that we made needed to be made again. Right. So, but you've got weeks to do it. Yeah, we've got one day, right? And you've got a few hours. And there's no reason we should be here right now, right? So we got to believe everybody. Same thought. We're going to make this show right now. Yeah. All right. So we sent him out there, and uh, and uh, he does good. He does good. This will be Mario's second attempt if he takes the green flag. You know, what do you do with the wing? Where's yeah. the wind? Here comes lap number one. Will it be enough? 218.910. That is good enough. Definitely picked up a headwind on the back straight again. We left probably a, I don't know, mile and a half of an hour out there on the average, but it was more than enough to bump the car that was on the bubble. Well, he's done it at least for now. As he comes down, we'll get the checkered flag, we'll get the fourth lap and the four lap average for Mario Dominguez, 218.4, and that puts him on the bubble. Good job, Mario, good job. Nice job, Mario. El Patron, you're the man. Just like the wind picked up. We made the field, but I knew he had been four slow laps. Because of the wind, I could tell that it was slow because of the, the behavior. Heading for the checkered flag. It is going to be oh so close. No, I don't think he's going to get a 218.375. 218.559. Five, he misses by less than a tenth of a mile an hour. So once you make the cut and you're in the show, your car is now frozen in pit lane because if you're what we call on the bubble, you can't touch your car to stay ahead of the changes. Correct. So you may have set up changes that you want to make to the car if someone goes faster than you, but you're not allowed to make those changes until you can't touch the car. It's literally as, as if you finished a race, yeah. Yeah. it's gone to park frame, it's, it's in sitting tech. in tech, right. yeah. and you can't touch the car. We know what we're doing, big yeah. bam boom. We're on it. Okay. We can take rear wing out if you want. It's good, do it. Just Kawa went out, he didn't make it, and I think Marty brought to it, and then uh, Lassier comes. Here he comes down the front straightaway on his first of four laps here on attempt number two. Buddy Lazier, 219.227, so laying the wing back was huge. It's getting toward the end of the day, and we're getting pretty comfortable. Like, we're, 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 we should be in the show. Yeah. It looks like, according yeah. to Lance, yes, the numbers are going to be there. Buddy Lazier, the 96 winner, is going to make it into the field. And then you finally get bumped. Yep. Buddy Lazier. <laughs> cool. <I don't> <laughs> what? Nope. nope. Not us. We're fine with Buddy Lazier. He's fine. We have to have time to take some rear wing out, otherwise we're not going to make it. But I knew we had to take rear wing off the race car. It was sticking too much, so we needed to trim it off a bit. So this car that's been trying to kill you all month, you're like, it's not killing me enough. Not at that point, no. Let's roll down there, we can take the wing out as we land or line up, let's go. So that car had been frozen in park for me because you weren't allowed to touch the car until you got bumped. Buddy Lazier bumps you. Now you can make adjustments and go make your run. Correct. But you've got minutes because at six o'clock, the gun, as we call it, goes off. And what does that symbolize? The end of the day. That's it. Let's go, guys. Let's go. Come on, do it while you're on it. Let's go. We are going up on the pad now. So you guys literally have to work on this car as it's being pushed because yes. that's how you have to make this work with the time you have. Yes. And the added wing change. Marty, they have made changes to Dominguez's car. They added a little bit of front wing, took out some rear wing. But to give you an idea of just how precious time is right now, the crew was running with the car, with the crew members literally hanging off the back wing, trying to make the changes as the car rolled to tech. In a normal world, would you make an aero adjustment on a rolling car? Only in these situations. Only like this. Again, we always talk about the nerves that you feel at this moment as they have fired the car. Oh my God, just make it, just make it, just make it because I knew, I knew that it was the end if, if he hit the wall. He is out, so he will get 
one more shot to put it into the field and could potentially be our last qualifier. The kids and I were sitting at home watching on TV and, you know, they're in. This will be the final qualifying attempt. Does Mario Dominguez make it in? I'm fine. If they take the, the degree of real ring that I need, I'm going to make it. We have one minute remaining in qualifying. Here comes the green flag. This will be our final qualifier for the 90-second running of the Indianapolis 500. Watch the lap tracker as he goes into one. This is destiny, right? It's meant to be. This is going to happen. Into the green, down the back straightaway. This looks strong. It's like, OK, it's good. we're going to make it. This is going to be amazing. Uh, it's looking good. All right, here's lap number one, 219.780. That is good. Oh, no, he spins it and hits the wall. And now almost gets airborne. Oh. And the gun has fired. Uh. Push. And you don't want to see that. You're all right there, Myra. You're all right. Was, unfortunately, that was, that was bound to happen. When you start making changes like that the last 20 minutes, you're really rolling the... Mother Ledo. <laughs> My little girl. My little. I did the first lap and I said, this is not going to happen. I was already sideways. You know what, why did the car spin? In the end, we just trimmed the car out and... Uh, there was a gurney that was missed on the lower rear element and it hung upside down. It created about 80 pounds, 75 pounds of downforce at 200 miles an hour. mechanics was saying, dude, I missed that gurney. I didn't get that on there. We had to, you went too quick. I wasn't done yet. I missed the gurney. And I think we would have had time to actually put it on there if we would have just taken two more seconds to do it. But in our haste and in, ah. Uh... I was not going to lift. You had to try all or nothing. When I was going to hit the wall, my emotions were like the worst in my life. Thinking about the whole team, mechanics, all the effort. After it was done and they loaded the car up, you know, we all stood there in the pit lane and just kind of tried to take it in. And then we headed back to the garage. And we got back to the garage, shut the garage door, you know. And I mean, I sat in that room with 25 grown men and we cried like babies. It was, it was the most surreal moment because it was so this culmination of all of this work and all these things that we'd all worked so hard. And that was that. So sitting in your home in yes. Oxnard, you're yep. fully aware oh, yeah. as that car is sliding to a yeah. halt, this is bad for you and these two young kids. Absolutely. How Absolutely. old are they at the time? Ben was 14 and Sophie was nine. You have three kids with you in this home watching yeah. this race. Yep. I just knew that, 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 that was it. Like that was it. That was the end of the chapter. We need to figure out something else, but it was rip your heart.
that is a terrible time to not have a good season in the history of our sport. Of course, it's very bad. Because you haven't been in a car since then. Correct, pretty much. What savings we had at the time, it evaporated. Um, you know, we were using our savings to live, to pay for tuition, to pay mortgage. Um, yeah, we were living on our savings, so. Was able to file bankruptcy on most of all of the debts that I had tax debt you can't file bankruptcy on yeah. and ultimately walked away from it losing everything but didn't have any residual debts that I carry from that yeah. so it's, it's all been put But how bed. long did it take to, to cover all of that like time wise? A decade. Michael's income was it and we ended up having to uh, short sell on the house. We I mean we did literally lose it all right? Yeah <laughs> yeah. Tyler lost his house yeah. Michael had to short sell his. Yep. Was there something like that that happened to you? We, we had to sell our house too. Because of an ultimate spiral that led from a confluence of all these things? Yes. You effectively kind of moved in with Tyler at the age of 19. I'm guessing mom wasn't thrilled with this. No. Well into adulthood after this IndyCar thing going south, you move back to Bend, Oregon so that he can work at a fuel cell company. <laughs> How does this go over back at home? Well, it was, uh, you know, it was hard to move home and lick your wounds and come home with your tail between your legs, but um, we had a great year. <laughs> <laughs> that year was fun. Yeah, well, I, I just wish I had the optimism you two have. Let me tell you about Michael yeah, Harvey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Joanna. Yeah. yeah. Poor Joanna Harvey. Yeah. yeah. The one person who cared. So this is you now. This is me now, yeah, man. Typical race car hustle. You know, a guy like me had to get a bunch of guys with money to get together to do something like this, and I was able to end up with a spot in it for myself as well. So nice. it worked out fantastic. Nice. We're sitting here 14 years later. Right. Seems like you're okay now. Better now, for sure. So, and we take care of a little bit of everything. LMP3 cars, cup cars, GT4 cars, GT3 cars, just a little bit of everything. Super fortunate to have landed in a spot where the pedigree of the things that I did formerly in pro racing, those experiences and, and, and contacts and all that can you know, now equal doing what I do now. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually quite a lot more fun. Uh, at this level of racing, guys will ask me at the end of the weekend, you know, where'd you qualify or how'd you do? Right. And I'll say, I don't really know, <laughs> but I know that all of my guys had a good time. Yeah, my customers are happy. My deal is I take care of the wealthy man or woman whose hobby is racing cars. So if that was you, you'd buy a Porsche and you'd give it to me, and effectively you'd arrive and drive. So yeah. everything that needs to happen between now and then, that's what we take care of. When you first started doing this kind of work, you made a very clever statement to me, which is you have no ambitions to do a program beyond what somebody's willing to pay for up front. Right. And that defines then what we do. So instead of being the guy that coerces them to do what the program is that I think is going to be best for me, I'm modifying my program to fit what it is that they want to go do. Now you got 20 Tom figures. No, 100%. You started working, what, when you were 15? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's basically everything that he's known. You know, he started sweeping floors and now he's where he is today. And it's, it's a part of who he is. At some point in our future, that will hopefully cease to be the case. <laughs> uh, retirement will be nice at some point, but it's, you know, it's just in his blood. I'm still working. I'll never give up on trying to do the Indy 500 again. 15 years later, you're still trying to do it. Yeah. I basically had to start from kind of ground zero again and rebuild my entire career. I think one of the biggest things that we're trying to capture with this story is that if you're a fan and you're watching and you see a car get bumped and it goes home, you might think, oh, it's a bummer. Yeah. That's too bad. But you yeah. don't realize that it absolutely can affect a real family uh, and yeah. real livelihoods. Yeah. Normally, people don't tell stories about the people that didn't make it, you know? 
people tell the success stories. People don't understand how hard it is for the people that don't make the race. It's, it's harder than anything. Did getting bumped change your life? Hell yeah. It was, it, was, it, was, it was catastrophic at the time, financially, professionally, all of that. But in retrospect, I wouldn't change a goddamn thing. It was a great experience. It really was. There's one more thing here you haven't talked about yet. I'd like you to explain what this is. Oh, this is the Jigger Award. Uh huh. So uh, as you can see, with all of the racing that we did, we, we had some results in every category that we ran in. This is our results from IndyCar. This is my results. So this is the Jigger Award. This is given to the guy who doesn't make the Indy 500. So if you get bumped on bump day, or you remember when Roger Penske's engines didn't do yeah, anything? Right. Yeah, So he has been the illustrious recipient of the Jigger Award as well. Okay. Very well known. You, you've heard of it, of course. No, no yeah. idea what you're talking about. Were things rocky between you two? No, I don't think so. I mean, we've, we've been through this multiple times, not to the extent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's a keeper. Oh. All right, so the, the timeshare salesman never leaves you. Right. During this 2008 season, you have no money to pay for any of the things you're asking for. Right. What is your favorite timeshare salesman barter? <laughs> I've got a deal put together for next year, and so the plan is going to be if we can just get through this next race, we can roll this over to next year. You know, I've got a plan for next year, so just... God, you were that guy. No, yeah, it was awful. Who'd you do that to? Mm. Stone? Man, I left those guys holding the <laughs> chunk of dough. <laughs> Honda, eat it. Hey, 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 <laughs> hey, hey, Sorry. Hey, hey. They, Shut the I up. know, I know. Yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> of the guys that I left holding the bag, they were the larger corporations, right? <laughs> okay. So your attitude was, if I'm f***ing the big guy, it's fine. Yeah, f*** the man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Screw him. <laughs> so you're why I can't get a raise. Kind of. We're here in Mexico City, right? You are, in fact, Mexican. Yeah. Confirmed. Yeah, I'm Mexican. So there's a race team. We'll just, we'll just come up with the name, Turner Motorsports, uh, in Massachusetts. <laughs> they uh, claim that authentic tacos don't have cheese in them. These guys have obviously never been to Mexico City and have eaten real tacos. There it I is. Mean, there it is. Southern California guys for quite a while. Does cheese go on a taco. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Can you get cheese on a taco in Mexico? Yeah, no question. Yeah. Hey, Will Turner. Cheese definitely goes on tacos. Hey, Will Turner, you are no taco authority. You're definitely not taco authority, <laughs> by all means. Will Turner, but you're invited to come down to Mexico and I'll show you some proper tacos you're going to like with cheese. Uh, he does hire silver drivers, though. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> We're on a road trip! <laughs>